Good evening, everyone. We are welcoming Linwood Barclay back from a whirlwind tour of the United Kingdom, and he's now here through Cleveland, Ohio. So I'm not sure I what shape are you in. Uh, well, I was, I was going to say, if I nod off during this, just give me a minute. <laughs> what is it like 4 a.m. now, UK time? I think it's, what is it now for me? UK? Yeah, 3 o'clock in the morning. I was going to say, well, I had, I had, I was going to say, I was actually talked to some people in a group in Cleveland last night, and I said, if I do nod off during the presentation, please give me a nudge. If I see you nodding off, I know we have an even bigger problem. Um, but yeah, I did a, uh, uh, when elevator, an elevator pitch came out a little earlier in the UK, and so on September 5th, I went over and I went to, um, started in Dublin, I went to Belfast, and to London, and then we was in London a few days, then we went back up to Scotland, to Edinburgh, Glasgow, and back to London. We were there for 10 days. I was there for 10 days. And then I came back to Toronto, where I live, on Sunday, late Sunday. I was home for 36 hours and then went out again. Mm -hmm. To Cleveland. To Cleveland. And, and here I am here today, and then I go tomorrow, I think I go to Tulsa. I just go to the airport and whatever my ticket says, <laughs> I just do that. And then, uh, then Tulsa, and then I, then Louisville, and then Kansas City, and then home. And this is all the deepest way to escape the excitement running up to your being father of the bride. Yes, because our daughter gets you get home. Our daughter gets married a week from Saturday. I had to think about that. And and as I was saying to Barbara earlier, um, it has not been a problem that I have not been there in the weeks leading up to this because no one has sought my opinion on anything. <laughs> not a single thing. And and I'm not even needed to write the checks. Need to, my wife's writing the checks usually when I'm not in the room and don't see them. And uh, so yeah, I'm not. I just have to be there. And I'm making. I think I've been given three minutes for a speech, um, which I was actually writing, working on the night before last or yesterday. At some point I was working. I was just typing away on the laptop while I was sitting in a hotel room in Cleveland. And uh, but it's short. I'm sure you'll be so well prepared after these weeks of speaking and all that. Oh, it's going to be. It's English. just going to be brilliant. Um, <laughs> actually, I'm going to tell sorry, I'll tell, I, I'm not even telling my wife what the story I'm going to tell. But I think I'll tell, one of the stories I want to tell is about how when my daughter was 19, she wanted to show that she could fly solo, just do her own thing. So she, that box over there reminds me, it was the telephone box. She went to London, England, and to go for four months, which she did, and she got a job and a place to live within a week. She mm -hmm. spent four months working for the top shop, Kensington High Street. And of course, this is before we were doing a lot of, this was like 13 years ago, before there was all the texting and, and so there's still sort of phone calls every night. My, my wife wanted to be sure that she, basically, that she got home every night while she's on the other side of the world. <laughs> and, and I was telling her, uh, one time I was telling things, oh, you have things you have to do while you're over there. You have to do this, you have to do that. And I said, you have to go to the St. Paul's Cathedral to the whispering don't. Because if you go to one side and you whisper, you can be heard on the other side. And she said to me, uh, Dad, I don't have anyone to whisper to. <laughs> so, now she does. So you like your intended son-in-law? Yeah, who well, I like a lot. Good. He's a really funny guy. He's, I like him a lot. He's a good guy. So what was Linwood buying? And the answer is he was buying shoe books by Don Winslow yes. because he's going to be interviewing Don. Uh, where at the Toronto Book Fair? So the uh, this is the 40th anniversary of the Toronto International Festival of Authors, which is a big, big festival. And um, they asked me to what they say curate an event, the organizer, which I think means you figure it out and uh, <laughs> find who you want to talk to and see if they'll come. And I talked to Don, and he's going to come. So I'm, I'm, going, I'm doing it. It's the opening. It's one of the opening night events, big event, and uh, it's a big hall, big huge hall. And uh, so I'm going to be Don. That's kind of really looking forward to it. Cause I'm a big fan. And, you will, uh, you will have a great time, and he is really unpredictable. Yes, so. I know. And I follow him on Twitter, and I don't know. I think he's the angriest man on Twitter next to David Simon, um, who's really angry. And I just love. And so uh, there'll be lots to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. And I'm a big fan, although I haven't read his really his early some of the early stuff. I have not read, and so um, I think the first book I read by him was Savages, uh, which is a totally different kind. Of thing. No, 
it isn't them. So he's got California Fire and Life and um, Death and Life of Bobby Z, which are two of my absolute favorite Don Winslow's. You may know him better for the cartel and um, the power of the dog, the cartel, and the border. So, um, but he's a very different kind of a writer, very versatile writer. Um, which is really what Linwood is. We were talking earlier about um, his Promise Falls books, which are um, very character-driven, kind of a long-term mystery soap opera and, and some other stuff. But recently, he's taken to weaponizing technology. So in this new book, Elevator Pitch, basically the, the elevator becomes the weapon. I was just saying I should do a killer toaster. But anyway. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, you remember there was a Seinfeld episode where Kramer wanted to do a coffee table book on coffee tables. <laughs> you know, and, and so this is kind of the equivalent. This is, this is uh, the elevator pitch for elevator pitch is that someone is, is sabotaging elevators and they're pitching their way down to the bottom of the shaft. So because when I wrote the first bit, the, our little proposal for my publishers of what I was going to do next, at the top of the page it said elevator pitch. So I, you know, they would think, oh, well, this is the this can tell us what his idea is. Thought, no, that's the title. And, and uh, <laughs> Elevator Pitch is the title. And so it is it is a story about a guy who, could, I mean, I, I think most people are familiar, at least here, with the use of the phrase Elevator Pitch as it relates to entertainment. Right. That it's, you know, you, you get onto an elevator with some producer and he's going to get off the third floor and that's how long you have to convince him that you've got this great idea for a movie. Like Shark Terrorizes Beach, which I think would really be a good movie. And <laughs> and so, um, but it was funny when I did the UK tour, they kept asking me, well, why didn't you call it lift pitch? Because <laughs> they call elevators lifts. Right. But lift pitch is the phrase, you know, like this doesn't work. So, so I would, I asked a lot of, it doesn't, it didn't hurt that it's called that over there because it's number six on the, on the London Times list, which is nice. But I would say to the audience, how many people here are, like when I was in Glasgow, I would say, how many people here are familiar with the phrase elevator pitch as it applies to entertainment. And out of a room of 100 people, like five hands went up. So yeah, so I had to explain it. And so I explained what the sort of double meaning was of the title. And, um, but that was fine. I but, think it's know, a wonderful title. Yeah. I really, and I really enjoyed it. I think The Noise Downstairs is a wonderful title for um, Linwood's last book. Have most of you read The Noise Downstairs? Because there, the typewriter is not a weapon, but it is the device by which the terror and suspense is introduced into the story. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. Of my, I mean, you, you know, when you're writing your own books that you, that you love the most, your favorites. And Noise Downstairs and this one are some of the ones I'm the happiest with. Noise Downstairs is about a guy who's sort, sort of having a post-traumatic incident after having s discovered a guy who's a friend of his in the course of getting rid of some dead bodies. And, you know, so he got, ended up killed himself. And his wife figures that she could he figures maybe he could, a way to tackle this, this anxiety is to write about it, because he's a college professor anyway. And his wife buys him to inspire him one of these old Underwood uh, manual typewriters, which he loves, he wanted, because he loves those old typewriters. He's not going to actually write it on it, but he has it in his office. There's one right over there. Yeah. On the table. And yeah. You can practice afterward if you want to. It and takes a lot of finger pressure. Oh, yeah. And very soon after he gets it, um, he's awake in the middle of the night by the sound of <laughs> But there's nobody in the house else, like this, other than his wife who's in bed next to him. And uh, and so he thinks, well, I must have been dreaming or something, you know, that couldn't have heard that. And after about the third night, before he goes to bed, he rolls some paper into the typewriter, and uh, in the morning, there's a message. Oh, how creepy is that? See, that's a great October book, right? I mean, <laughs> um, which I find fascinating. So. I was telling Linwood that right after I read the advanced reading copy for Elevator Pitch, the Wall Street Journal published an article about the Otis Elevator Company, and they are creating smart elevators using facial recognition and so forth. So if you are the tenant <laughs> in the building, you walk in and step up to the elevator, and it becomes your elevator. It recognizes you, it opens the door, and it takes you to your floor, and nobody else you know, can do that. And I thought it's just really setting up, um, you know, a potential hacker to, to, you know, could easily become something that would kill you, right? Or allow you to be robbed or whatever might happen. I think that 
Okay, we've reached the point now, any device that has the prefix smart in yep. front of it, it's going to be nothing but a huge pain in the ass. It's going to be a real problem. Well, I mean, a smart right. car can be turned in. Somebody's got, oh, yeah. um, you know, or a smart car basically can. I just read a thriller where in the end, the guy steps into his smart car having um, decimated, you know, the world or whatever it all is. And the car takes him captive and takes him away you know, <laughs> to his grisly fate. Um, and he recognizes that as it's happening to him, and you know he can't get out. And so it's pretty really very nice. But what I, what I found when I did this book about elevators and this um, is that people are way more freaked out by elevators than I realize. Far more people than I realize are really troubled or not happy with them. And and. Uh, and because I guess they, they seem to present a kind of intersection of phobias. There's claustrophobia, fear of heights, fear of falling, loss of control, and then that whole thing about getting into a crowded space with people you don't even know. All these things come together, and so a lot of people just don't like them. And in some of the events I did in the UK, as one guy came up and says, my wife has never been in one. She won't go in them. She's just she's just freaked out by them. She'll, doesn't matter how tall the building is, she'll take the stairs. No, the buildings are lower over there anyway, so it's not a big deal. Um, but, but I mean, it's just she, she won't do them. She won't, she yeah. won't want them. She won't, she won't fly either, but that's, that's another book. Um, but, uh, but a lot of people are really totally freaked out by them. And it was fun to do, uh, I was telling you before, it was fun to do some of the research for this, you know, what, what research, what I did, the amount that I did. I went to, um, Toronto has a great many skyscrapers, and in fact, if you haven't been to Toronto in 10 years, you'll re barely recognize it. It's like Hong Kong. There's just so many massive condo towers have gone in. The skyline is transformed. So I, um, uh, this fellow who is oversees all the elevator operations in one of the big office skyscrapers took me around. First I thought, well, he probably won't want to when I tell him I'm writing a book about a guy who sabotages elevators to, you know, to kill people. And I thought he's going to just say, well, I, I, I really don't want to talk about it. <laughs> First thing he said was, oh, that's great. I can think of all kinds of ways you could do that. <laughs> so, so he took me around, and we did produce some really cool stuff. For example, like we would go to the 20th floor, and we could get off the elevator, but then he had this device that he could do all these things with, and he could leave the door open, and then we would send the elevator to the 19th floor, so that we could leave, and then we'd leave the door open at the 20th, and we could look at the top of the elevator, and look at the car, and look at the cables, and the shower, all this sort of stuff, and step onto the top of the elevator, and all these, all these other things. But this device that he had looked like a really large TV remote, basically, and he said, with this thing, I can control, I can do, I can control every elevator in the building and everything that it does, up and down, doors open, close, the whole thing. I said, wow, that's pretty crazy gadget. I mean, I, those must be hard to, to get. And he said, oh, you can get one of these for 500 bucks on eBay. And, and I thought, now, as a regular person, a member of the public, you might think, that's not, that's not a good thing. But as a thriller writer, it was like, yes, this, that's so great. I have a book. You know, um, now, and you would have to know a lot about how to use it, how to, inter how, how to create the interface between it and this particular building. This, it wouldn't be easy. But the fact that that's a device that you can buy, I thought that's really, that's wonderful news. So you, you, took this book, you took this book to Manhattan where there are a significant number yeah, of... Yeah, it's in the right place. You can't really live in New York in a high rise unless you are willing to take the elevator. It just wouldn't pan out. But I was also thinking of you some years ago when my husband and I went to Istanbul and we checked into the Para Palace Hotel before it has been modernized. So this is the old Para, Para, Para Palace Hotel where Agatha Christie stayed. It's the terminus of the Orient Express. She was in room 400 and something uh, where she wrote, you know, they came to Baghdad. But it had the her first elevator in Istanbul and it's this shiny silver steam powered originally but now I can't remember and it's a serious antique and they have a uniform guy whose only job is to operate the elevator but he's not just a guy that sits on a stool and you know picks the floor he actually has to rev up the elevator and it only goes up two floors you know, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not a tall building, but you wanted to do it for the experience, and you know, it, it's hard to believe because I mean, it's only a little over a hundred years ago that this was the elevator. Yeah. You know, um, and it's a, it's an amazing technology, you know, that has 
If you fly into the Dubai airport, for example, the Krups, the Thyssen, is it pronounced Tyson Krups? I never can remember. T H Y S S E N Krups. You, they do the all of the stuff at Sky Harbor. If you fly in and out, you will look at the escalators and the elevators and stuff at our airport are all Tyson Krups. It's a German. And anyway, their thing, their big thing is elevators. And the Dubai airport is like a thousand levels and stuff. And there's all this wizardry going, you know, up and down, elevators, escalators, you know, all this other stuff. So clearly it's an enormous um, technology, you know, that there's a, real serious investment in. And we're, and of course, Dubai is that, has that one astonishingly tall building. What is it, 140 floors or whatever? Uh, yes. That's the one that was in the Mission Impossible movie. I didn't go in it. Um, <laughs> so we, I've been invited to that festival in February this time, this next year, the one they have Dubai in Dubai. Dubai or Sharjah? Uh, Dubai. Well, Sharjah I've been invited to as well, but I don't think I can do it. But the Dubai one in February I've been invited to, so we'll be seeing that. But you know, it's. I guess there's sort of two main, these two main names you see when you go in the elevator. There's Schindler and there's Otis. And I kept wondering. In this if country, I should, right? Yeah, Most I kept wondering if I should have called the book Schindler's Lift. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would have satisfied your UK audience if you right. called it Schindler's Lift. See, they would have gotten lift in that elevator. I think that's. I'm here all week, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I think elevator pitch was a wiser choice. I think it's choice. probably better, yeah. A wiser choice, indeed, right. So you must have had a really good time um, working out the, I mean, this is, I mean, it's character driven, obviously, yeah. and you have to have motives, but you must have had a really good time figuring out the technology. It was It was a really, this was a very fun book to do. Um, and, uh, and you know, there's, it, it, it starts on a Monday. There's sort of, there's an elevator catastrophe on Monday which they think is just an accident. Then there's one on Tuesday, and they think, wow, what a coincidence. By the time Wednesday rolls around, they realize, we, we have a problem. <laughs> and But when I was writing it, I kept thinking, what's the next really bad accident going to be in hell? And I couldn't wait to get to each one. And, uh, you know, but but it is, but I, and of course, the, as you said, the book isn't just about those events. It no. is, there's, I think it has a lot of really interesting characters. It's got this mayor of New York, um, whose name is Richard Headley, but the press likes to take Richard, because a lot of people whose name is Richard is go by Dick, so they call him Dick Headley. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he is kind of that. And, uh, and humor for everybody. And, and a couple of interesting cops, uh, one who's kind of having a bit of a PTS, PTSD problem. And then the character I really love is a woman named Barbara Matheson, who is a, a political columnist for an online uh, for a website, because you know newspapers are all over, and uh, I know all about that. I worked at them for years, and I think so. She's kind of a different kind of column. She's not waiting to write a column for a paper every day. She's writing things as they happen, right. and she's doing opinion pieces, mm -hmm. and she's really got it in for the mayor. And so, uh, but she, when the first uh, elevator catastrophe happens, one of her someone she knows is is a victim. And so she becomes involved in this, and she's trying to figure out, as is everyone else, who's doing it and why. And uh, which we're not going to reveal. Which we are not going to talk about. Right, presently. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, I, all of your books are character driven, even if you're deciding to introduce technology as the um, methodology, so to speak. But um, I've always liked the different sets of characters that you have drawn. We were talking earlier tonight about No Time to Say Goodbye, which is, was your first that was the big, that was big breakout, breakout book. book. And that's when I met Linwood. We met at the Frankfurt Book Fair when he was um, over there with his UK publisher. Mm -hmm. Have you always, you, you've actually had a bigger audience in the UK? Up For a long time, the UK has been my uh, biggest market. Right. Um, I sell more books there than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But since then, I mean, I do really, places where I do really, I mean, Canada's great for me, obviously, because then I'm from there. Uh, Canada's good. I do really well in France. They made a TV series, a six-part series out of one of my books in France. Yes, it's on uh, Acorn, and it's called L'Accident, or The Accident. Yeah. And you might, you might have seen it. And you watch it on Acorn? It's very good. I yeah, I was really, we went over for the, uh, for the last couple of days of the shoot. We right. wish they were shooting it in a little small village up on the, Northern coast of France, I guess on the channel there or whatever. Plymouth uh, uh, Valandre was a sort of town. It was just lovely. And so um, we went up for, for some of that. And uh, but I thought they did a nice job of it. I mean, it's all subtitled. Um, and I, and 
but I, I like subtitles. I hate dubbing. It drives me crazy. Yeah. And I thought they did a really nice job of it. Of course, they changed all of the place names, all the character names, because they made it French. Right. But they followed the plot right to the letter. Like, they just, they didn't, they didn't deviate from it. I think the French are making absolutely terrific crime novels. Yeah. My husband and I are really addicted to them. And you can find them on MHC, and you can find them on Acorn. <clears throat> They're good because they really make use of the French landscape and the French culture along with the story. So you can have a lot of scenic, um, you know, tourists. But they seem to be way ahead. I've tried watching some of the German things, and they don't, they just don't work as well for me. Yeah, I thought that the, I thought that what they did for um, the accent, it had a kind of broad church kind of feel to it. Yeah, and you know, Harlan had his first movie was um, Tell no a one. French Tell No One. And it's really good. Yeah, it's it really is. good movie. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so they're doing, yeah, they're doing some really, I remember a French thriller that came out in the 70s, late 70s, that was just loved called Diva. Do you remember Diva? Yes, Does anybody remember, I do Diva? remember Diva? About a guy, about an opera singer who won't allow anyone to record her, all of her performances. If you want to hear her, you have to go to see her. She had no records, doesn't it? And this about this young guy who's enthralled with her and goes in and makes a secret recording of her. It's a really good movie. It's very arty. You know, it's yeah. really kind of an art film. There's but some French company at the moment that's doing fabulous Agatha Christie novels, but they're doing them in French. Um, and they have, um, instead of Poirot, it's Inspector Laurence. Um, and there's this little sidekick who's a newspaper columnist. She's basically, um, who was proud of Colonel, what was his name in the Poirots? I'm having a blank, but you know, he had a sort of a, a sidekick. I was going to say mustard, but that's a game. <laughs> that's blue. Right. Um, it'll come to me. Hastings. Hastings. Right, is the guy. But anyway, it's really fun to see the French doing Agatha Christie, you know, taking um, one of her classic books and then doing it, setting it not actually in Paris, but, you know, some other city and so forth. I think they're funny, um, but also really well done. So. Yeah, they're doing really, some really good stuff over there. Yeah. I'm, there was, uh, it looked like some other, there was another one that was going to get made over there, but it's going to do a bit of a headache, but I think that eventually there's going to be another one. So is Promise Falls heading for TV in Canada, do you think? So, um, so, I, so I did, I've done several novels that set in a place called Promise Falls, which is somewhere in upstate New York. And then I did three books that were linked, really, as one sort of long story, and that was uh, Broken Promise, Far From True, and The 23. And so... E1, Entertainment One, has uh, optioned those to turn into a series, and now we have a Canadian broadcaster that has come on board. And I'm involved, I'm writing, I've written uh, the second draft of the pilot episode, and um, and we'll see what happens. I mean, just because it's this gone this far doesn't mean it'll get made. Right. You know, there's, and I've been here before, you know. Right. And so I'm not jumping up and down yet, but it's it's such a it's such a long process. I mean, it's been it's been two years since the first contract to to develop into a series, and now two years later we're to the point where I am have now submitted the second draft of the pilot episode. Wow. You know, and so um, it's moved slowly. What is it? What's the difference between for you? writing a novel and writing um, a script, because they are clearly different beasts. Yeah, well there's, and it depends which aspect we're talking about. If we're talking about the actual writing, and not any of the other stuff, the politics, all I other stuff, if it's just the writing, I love writing scripts. I think it's really fun, because you really take a book idea and you distill it to its essence. It's what they're doing and what they say, and none of this no backs, no acres and pages of backstory, no pages and pages of inner dialogue, monologue about what should I do. It's just right there. And I like that. I really like writing. It's really fun. And it's, for me anyway, it's very, it's very quick because when you're used to writing, you know, 2,000 words a day in an actual novel, uh, writing a screenplay compared to that seems relatively straightforward. It seems a little easier. So, I mean, I could write what I wrote, I wrote a movie adaptation for my novel, Never Saw It Coming, which we got made into a movie in Canada. And I wrote that screenplay in nine days, based on my book. And, and I think I wrote the draft, the first the draft of this pile up in about two weeks, you know. So basically you take the book and you just remove everything but the dialogue? Yeah, well, I don't even do that. It's, I just find that I, 
I know the story, right. and then I kind of stop looking at the book, and I just kind of write it again. But it's because if I start looking for actual bits of dialogue and pick them up, it's going to be it's almost harder. Okay. It's like it's almost like if I read the book and then I just put it over there and I told you what it was about. And this guy said this and this, and I kind of do that kind of thing. And then every once in a while I go back to the book and think, okay, what's going on? And oh yeah, right. And then I just kind of know I need this scene, I need this scene, and I need this scene. But I don't write them the way I would in a book because in a book, you know, can, I mean, you can be, you can kind of write flabbily in a novel. You know, you like the dialogue and kind of be long-winded and they can do this. That. But when you're writing a script, you have to, you have to be able to justify every single word. Right. There's no flat because there's, there's so no little time. Flat. There's no flat. Every line has to matter, and so I write it. I write it that way, and I think, well, what's what's the what has to happen in the scene, and how fast can I communicate that? But you also have to allow for the you know whatever structure of the set or mm -hmm. something. You can't have a scene. You know, if you're in a house, if you're filming it inside a building or something, you can't write a scene where that can't happen. So you have to modify what you're what you're doing to fit the physical space. So. So that part I love. I really like that. The part that's that's uh, that's more time consuming and what's different. I mean, when you, first of all, when you write, when you have a book contract, the book comes out. But when you have a contract to write for TV or for movie, you really don't know. Like, will it ever come out? Will they make it? You just it, it might happen. It might not. You're just not sure. And so that's been my experience. I had this experience two and a half years ago when. I may have told this story here before, but a couple, like two and a half years ago, <clears throat> uh, a guy named Martin Campbell, who directed the Bond movie Casino Royale, right. the more recent one, and also GoldenEye and a bunch of other stuff, he wanted to make a six-part series out of my book, Trust Your Eyes, and wanted me to write all six episodes. Mm -hmm. So I went to London, and there were meetings, and I went to this network, and, and we went had a private tour of the, of the uh, Parliament buildings, because we wanted to shoot some scenes there, and I stood right where the Boris Johnson, Yahoo, would stand and yell at me. <laughs> and, and then I Such spent... an idea for a new book, right? That's there. right. <laughs> and, and I spent the next six months, I spent the next six months writing 12, 15 drafts of the first episode, mm -hmm. which he really liked. And then finally the network said, nah, I don't think we'll do it. <laughs> and so that's TV. And, and there's so many people who weigh in with an opinion. This or it's all done by committee. It's all done yeah. So, so all I wanted to do when I was 15, 16 years old, growing up in rural Ontario, going to high school in the middle of the countryside, a place called Fenton Falls, all I wanted to do was write for television. I was a kid of the 60s and 70s. I just loved TV. I wanted to write for television. And there was very low demand for it in that area because it was mostly dairy farming. And so <laughs> they don't need a lot of... TV writers at the dairy farm. So, um, and so, but that's what I want to do. And now, you know, 50 years or more later, I'm having this opportunity. I'm going, I don't know, it's a lot of work. <laughs> you know. Well, it's never, I asked you that because I have an author of my own whom I'm very, very fond of. Um, and he's he's a movie guy and he's a script writer. Mm -hmm. And the problem, he, he writes books as though they were scripts and then um, it takes an enormous amount of effort to get him to write all the bits that scripts live out, live out. Because see, he thinks that because the expression, you know, the, the actor can convey so much stuff that but in a book you have to you have to describe it. But but he's so he's so used to the, the actor it's hard for him to do all the parts you're talking about. So when he writes a novel it's very spare, like it's just very, very, spare. very spare. Yeah, and so my, my you know, some some novelists you have to really cut because there's more material there than is necessary. Um, I have one of those from India who I really love, but it's all about removing all the unnecessary words so you get to the basics. But with this other author, it's the opposite thing, which is, you know, you you have the bare bones and then in a novel you have to flesh yet, it out. And yet there are novels like that. I think of Ken Bruin. Or he's pretty spare. He's very spare. Or yeah. Elmore Leonard, you know, people like that. They well, that's why Elmore spare, Leonard's like, books were so great for the movies. They yeah. hardly had to touch them. You know? it. It's <laughs> all there. Like, you know, just, it's right. just there, right? I mean, imagine getting paid to write the screenplay version of an Elmore Leonard book. Basically, you're just using a photocopier. <laughs> and you're going to get a whole bunch of money for that. That doesn't seem right. Well, that's very true. 
And yeah. then, you know, we can go back to that great story about Raymond Chandler. When, and who was it that was actually writing the big, the movie script of The Big Sleep? It was some other famous author. And anyway, at some point, he sent a note to Chandler and he said, Ray, you know, what, I um, can't remember which scene it is, you know, why is this here? What's going on in this scene? And Chandler wrote back, damn if I know. Uh, because Chandler was not actually a terrific plotter, you know, and so he had some holes. How many of you have seen the movie, The Big Sleep? Any you what? Well, have you ever seen the director's cut? Because the movie doesn't make any sense. I love this story, I'll tell you, because it's so fun. Um, if you see the director's cut, the part that makes sense suddenly is there, the scenes that were cut. So you say to yourself, what happened? And it turns out um, that what happened was that Lauren Bacall was a brand new starlet, and her agent, or however it was that was able to do this, wanted her to have more face time in the movie, and in order to keep it within the time constraint of the movie, they cut out the critical scene about which the whole plot, <laughs> in order to have a scene with Lauren Bacall, that doesn't make any sense because it wasn't in the book. So if you, seriously, Betty, you should go and watch the director's cut version, and it's like, you know, all of a sudden. So even though The Big Sleep as a book is not perfect, the movie, <laughs> the movie could have been closer, you know. And that's why thing. Hollywood is so great to work with. Absolutely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just, I just that told imagine that happened while you're writing a novel and someone knocked on the door to your study and said, um, you're going to have to take out all these scenes here because I want you to put this, my girlfriend, in your book or something, you know. Which is exactly how it is. So I think they can't get enough people to sign up for the screen, get in, break into Hollywood. No one has signed up for that at the conference next week because everybody's just had it. <laughs> frustrated. You, you write something for three years and they cut it. Yeah. Well, there's some, you know, I had the joy. There was a, I don't know if any of you watched, um, oh, Person of Interest. Do you remember Person of Interest? Mm -hmm. I thought Person of Interest was really fabulous. And then all of a sudden it kind of went south. Um, and it went from all this, every episode would be the facial recognition programming. We're actually moving towards the technology that is central to Person of Interest. Mm -hmm with facial recognition. The Chinese are way ahead of us, okay? So they would, you know, they would get um, some kind of computer warning that this person was about to be killed or jeopardized or something. They would rush out and save him. So every, every episode was brand new. But then it disintegrated into wars between two rival um, facial recognition control, like two 1984 kind of scenarios and which one was gonna win and on and on it went. But there was a really horrendous ending to it, and I was so pissed. And then magically, <laughs> magically, we did an event one night with Joe Day, and I'm trying to remember the name of the woman. And I took him out afterward, and as happens when we're having a drink or two afterward, the conversation flows. She revealed that she was the writer, a writer, a person of interest, and she was the one who was stuck with writing the episode. And I said to her, what happened? And then she pointed out that it was, in fact, that kind of a committee decision thing, you know, and that she got all this hate mail, you know, for being the writer that had done this and the whole bit. But it, I was, you know, I realized that the, the reason I didn't like the, the way the show ended was because it turned into this kind of group effort. And you know, the, the um, uh, my two favorite movies ever are Rear Window and Vertigo. Two Hitchcock mm -hmm. movies. And sometimes my favorite movie is Vertigo, and then the next day I think, no, it's Rear Window. But there's a scene in Vertigo that makes no sense. Yes. And it's when he's following her, and she goes into the rooming house where she's supposedly rented a room as Carlotta Valdez. And then uh, Jimmy Stewart goes in to go up to the room, and the woman, who's Ellen Corby from the Waltons, is on the front desk. And she said that she didn't come in, and he didn't, she didn't see her. And so it's like she just went into this place, and she just evaporated and vanished. And it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And I was so puzzled by it. I've watched the movie a hundred times, and I watched it, and I thought, I have to go online and read about this. And, and so they asked Hitchcock, it wasn't a committee thing, they asked Hitchcock, what about that scene? And he goes, yeah, and it was kind of like his response was, oh yeah, it really doesn't make any sense, but it's one of those kinds, I'd like to do a scene where later, after you've seen the movie, you'll get home and you go, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> what the, what, what? 
So he destroyed it for that. He could do that. Yeah. No, he did. I mean, I think his movies, and then his wife was, you know, Alma was a big yeah. part of all the Hitchcock movies. But we, when we lost Hitchcock, we lost a lot. I oh, yeah. He was just amazing. Um, the, the I liked that. I did get great reviews, but I liked that movie called Hitchcock, where, um, uh, yeah. oh, what's her name? Helen Mirren plays his wife. Alma. And it's, what's his face? It's, you know, Silence of the Lambs guy. Is the place Hitchcock with a lot of makeup. I like that movie a lot. It's really interesting. I don't know how much. I think a lot of, and, and um, uh, Scarlett Johansson plays uh, Vera Miles or whatever in the site, playing in Psycho or whatever. It's good. Yeah, it's interesting. Movie. Have you ever thought about writing a novel about about a movie or about movies? You could write an interesting suspense that were set. Not so far. That's the idea. I mean, I've not said, I, have, I haven't thought of doing that, but you never know. Getting away from cars and elevators and yeah. typewriters, you know, <laughs> putting into the pit in Hollywood. So, do any of you have questions that you would like to ask Linwood? We can't really talk much about elevator pitch or we'll completely ruin it. Yeah, we don't want to ruin it for him. So. It's, about, it's about elevators. I do have an elevator <laughs> yep. pitch question. Yep. I'm one of these people who's afraid of elevators. Is this going to make it worse? You're my target audience. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're not afraid of elevators at all, I mean, why would you even read this? Think, well, this doesn't bother me. No, you're my. You're my target. I was at an event, so I did an event at the BBC last week, and it was this really cool show, and there were all about different people there from different backgrounds, and there was this one woman who's, who's uh, I think the wife of this jazz artist who'd been in, and she got talking, she says, oh, she said, I don't know if I can read that, I just, they, the elevators terrify me, and I said to her, you're my target audience, and I said to the publicist, let's give her a book, and so it's so like, everyone right there, I said, you must read this. So, I mean, the thing is, when you watch a scary movie, don't you watch scary movies because those are the things that scare you? You don't watch a scary movie and think, I'm gonna watch this movie about werewolves because werewolves don't scare me. So so this is your it's this is for you. <laughs> Anyone else? You feeling pressure to have the next idea? Because this is pretty Oh there's always I always feel pressure. Scares was really good. I, there's always pressure. I and mean, it's funny, I was I was telling Barbara earlier that I have you tend to, do, when you write a book a year, you tend to deliver a manuscript to your publisher around the time a book comes out. And I have delivered a book, um, but it's also a bit techy. It's kind of more like a Michael Crichton thriller. And even I'm a bit nervous about it because I think maybe it's too different from what I usually do. And then I foolishly told my editors, what I was, my publisher, what I was gonna write next. And they said, oh my God, that idea is so great. We'll wait for that. So instead of coming out with a book next September, I think we'll probably be, it'll probably be uh, like January of 21, I'll just, and they'll do it then. And we were talking about this earlier that regardless of what your politics is, next fall is not a really good time to come out with a novel or a book or anything. Because the, 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 the election will just, it'll The fiction it will, unfolding in front of you it'll will be, take it, over. You, can't, right. you won't be able to write anything that's stranger than what's really happening. <laughs> and so, um, and so I think that to come out with a novel Know, next September, October, or whatever, you'll never, you'll never be able to get any attention for it because uh -huh. it's you'll just be completely carpet bombed with political news. Mm -hmm. So it's good to, it's a good period to stay away from. So I think I'll, if the world still exists in January twenty one, <laughs> that's when that book will come out. This next one, that's other, which I'm not going to read a word of. As you know, a nice time to visit Scottsdale. It's perfect. That would From be Toronto, really, in particular, that would be a really good time to come down here just for a week and just you know have uh, sangria by the Hotel Valley Old Pool. <laughs> Why you loll in the hot tub? That's right. I, yeah. said, I did that today. Yes, Linda did that last last winter, didn't he? I said really I got here early enough today to come, so I so I went in the I went in the hot tub outside, and then I even went and had a massage. Wow. That's why I'm even groggier than I would. <laughs> and so I posted a picture from the hot tub, which um, was tasteful, but um, <laughs> but I just put you know to her hell is what I said. <laughs> Yeah, hot tub technology. There's something you could try boiling somebody. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. I mean, if you're gonna really yeah. get into this, I remember every, every, I think every other movie that I saw as a kid had somebody trapped in one of those steam machines. You know, the big yeah. fold over. It was done over and over again. It was like I don't know. I was talking about this with somebody else. I was convinced as a kid that I would die in quicksand because every movie and show I saw, somebody was in quicksand. And I thought it's everywhere. Like it's just you can't go outdoors. It's just probably it's quicksand. <laughs> Interesting how we get phobias, isn't it, when we're kids? Well, really, it, was, it, was, it was always that whether it was the Three Studios or Abbott and Costello, but they always, everybody was in the jungle and they were trapped in quicksand every episode. 
And I thought, they have a real, they need to fill these holes up, really. It's just really a problem. See, I'm a person who knew that if you clicked your heels three times at Ruby Slippers, you could fly yes. over the deadly <laughs> desert with a quicksand, so I never was panicked about it. So I'm really glad Patrick came out because um, Linwood is going to be interviewing Don Winslow, and he's bought a couple of early Winslows, right. but I told him that he was at like Winslow Central when he was in this bookstore. So yeah. if you were going to be talking to Don, uh, what, what sort of thing would you ask him? Patrick's a real scholar of Don Winslow. What sort of thing would I ask him? Yeah. yeah where to begin? I know. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I got, that was the question I just asked you. Where to yeah. begin? Do you follow him on Twitter? No. Oh, you should. I've heard about that. You <laughs> should follow him on Twitter. I was just saying. Other than, aside from David Simon, I think he's the angriest man on Twitter. Like, he's just, he's so, so angry. And I, it's, I love reading him, it's that fun. Yeah. Oh, what, what, would you, what would you say about Don's evolution as a writer when you go all the way back to his graduate student, Neil, and like the long trail to Buddha's mirror? Yeah. And then follow him. We, we've got for him um, California Fire and Life and the Death and Life of Bobby Z. Right. Um, and that was before Power of the Dog, which really has changed things. But yeah. I guess I would I would ask him, how do you do it? That would be my question, because you know he's he's just he's an amazing writer, and but he's also so I, I think if if you were to read Savages and also read The Border, you would think that's the same guy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's the same writer. Like he's like. As a writer, he adopts a, a different persona for some of his books, and it's as if it was written by somebody else. Well, so I, I find a, that really interesting. He's kind of an elf anyway, you know, so yeah, well, it's almost yeah. as though he can slip identities and so forth. I mean, we bring him up because he's been here for all of his books. I was, I, as we're going to turn 30 on October 3rd, and I uh, was asked to do an, an interview, which I'll we'll do next week, and one of the questions I'm supposed to think about were, landmark events, but also, you know, how many writers have signed their first books here? And I said the real question is how many writers have signed every one of their books here, which is actually a very impressive, very impressive list, but Don is one of them. Um, you know, and so we've gotten, Patrick and I, and yesterday, we've gotten to watch the evolution of a lot of writers from their very first book all the way all the way along, and, and a lot of different writers. Lisa C., Diana Gabaldon, Michael Conley, Lee Child for 16 books, Don, you know, William Kent Kruger, who really has done some amazing things, Steve Hamilton, I mean, it just goes, and more recent ones, Joe Ede and Nick Petrie and all, I mean, it's really been, it's been, it's been fascinating, isn't it, to watch how they evolve. CJ Fox. CJ, oh, yeah. yeah, and Craig, who will be here tomorrow night, Craig Johnson, all of his books. CJ, all of his yeah. books, you know, um, yeah, so, been fascinating. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that you're a lot funnier than your books. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. hasn't read your four humor novels. <laughs> yeah, you haven't read the early ones. You haven't read the You're the target audience for his original uh, books. I wrote uh, four funny thrillers, actually, before I wrote No Time to Buy, <laughs> by a character named Zach Walker, and you might like those. Um, First one, first one is called Bad Move. I don't know if you have it or not, but the first one is called Bad Move. And um, there's, but I think there's, I think there's humor in all the. I think there's, it's funny. Some of the reviews, a couple of the reviews in the UK about Elevator Pitch commented on how funny it was. Oh really? Yeah, because it's, well, it's, you know, what's not funny about Elevator Catastrophe? <laughs> but, I mean, but I mean, he says plunging to your death down. The but he said, that, but they said there's a lot of. They found a lot of. They did find a lot of humor in it, and I think it's. Humor often comes in out of dialogue <laughs> with people who are kind of sarcastic and fed up with each other, and that's sort of where they bicker and or banter and so forth. And I think that's humor comes from from that in times. But they have quoted some other examples. But it's it's um, there's some kind of funny irreverent parts in, in between the severed limbs. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you've maybe said it before, but was Bad Move based on your wife leaving her person? Yes. Part? Okay. Uh, well, that was the, that was where that whole story began. So, bad moves about um, a very anxious, anxiety-riddled kind of guy who's everything, everything panics him. And um, he, what happened to me one night? One day, my, my wife and I, you know, the little the little kitty seat in the shopping cart, where where if you don't have a kid, that's where my wife she puts her purse, and and we'll usually leave it wide open so you can see the wallet, and then she wanders down to the end of the aisle in the grocery store, and I'm thinking. 
what are you doing? Like, why don't I just put my wallet there too? And then the <laughs> thief goes by again. And so I remember one time I I looked at that and I thought, I should pretend to steal it, her purse, and put it in the car. And then when she panics, uh, she'll realize that she should never do that again. She'll thank me. I know she'll thank me. And, and, and I actually, I thought about doing it, and I, I decided not to do it. I decided not to do it because I wanted to live. And, and so I did do it. But then I thought, what if I were the kind of guy who would do that? And so Zach was born. And so there's a lot of incidents that lead up to a sort of a middle point of the book, but, but we reached that point. And Zach's at the grocery store, and he's, he's talking to his wife about the 240. He sees her down at the end of the aisle in the grocery store, and there's the there's the shopping cart, and there's the purse, and he thinks, I've had it. I've really had it. So he, he he happens to go down and say to his wife, I'm going to go wait in the car. Come on and get me when you're done. And as he goes back, he grabs the purse, tucks it under his coat, goes and throws it in the trunk of the car, and he waits. He just he can't wait. He, but anyway, finally his wife gets out of it and gets in the car and slams the door, and she says, they did that. All the meat looked terrible. Let's go to the next store. And, and so because she didn't need her purse, so somehow she has herself forgotten it. And, and you know how when you play a trick on somebody, you're waiting for the payoff and it doesn't happen. And, and so he can't take it. They're driving along. He can't stand it anymore. So finally he says to her, he says, uh, hey, honey, where's your purse? And she sort of panics briefly. And then she says, well, you know how you've always been going at me about how I'm always leaving my purse where somebody could find it. So I got one of these little fanny packs. And she shows how she's. I got my wallet in here, and I got the driver. Got my driver's license. All stuff right in this little fanny pack. So whose purse is in the trunk of the car? <laughs> That's not even the funniest part. I know. <laughs> but that was how it all began. So and it's funny. I started writing that book, and that that incident was chapter one. And I wrote a hundred pages of that book, and then I realized, no, I have to have other events that set up his character first and so then i realized i'd written the middle of the book and then i wrote all this other stuff before it so anyway you might like those yeah. but zach he means well <laughs> yeah you mentioned a couple of times that his twitter account uh statements are so angry don what what are they angry about Politics. what's he angry about I, there's there's apparently a, a, a politician that a lot of people don't like in America right now. I, I can't remember the name, but he provokes a lot of anger, and Don vents a lot about him, but in an uh, interesting way. Uh, Just, I'm sure I'd like him. <laughs> <laughs> there was a very, very interesting essay, and in, I think it was the journal, I don't think it was the time, I think it was the Wall Street Journal that said this particular politician has created a perpetual state of war. And he's at war all the time with everything, and characterizes all opponents and so forth as enemies, traitors, whatever. So he has created a, a, a war mindset rather than any kind of a cooperative mindset. And I thought that was really, um, really insightful. And I mean, if you've, and if you've read Don's book, The Border, or any of that stuff, you, you will kind of know where he's coming from. Yeah. But, uh, but he's interesting to follow, and for other reasons too. Are you on Twitter? I have it. I don't ever check it. Yeah, I'm on. I'm on Twitter like a hundred times a day. Uh, I post on it a lot. Well, I'll and, start following you. And I post on it a lot, and I read a lot. I find stuff breaks there. Uh, fat, very fascinating anywhere. It seems to. I know. I, Susan keeps us current with everything I know. Susan right, does our. Out that the politician was our president. <laughs> You're right. That's who it was. <laughs> I never would have guessed. <laughs> yeah. It comes back to me now. Yeah, but no. there, there really is a lot of, of interesting, and, and there are some people who find a natural, I mean, like Ian Rankin, whom we all love. It's great. Twitter, Twitter is his, like, natural, you know, place to hang out and so forth. So I keep up with Ian, whom I'm very fond I, of, by just following Twitter. You know, for, for 14 years, I wrote three columns a week for the Toronto Star, allegedly a humor column. But they were about 600 words. Then I gave up that column to write books full time. But every once in a while I get an idea that I think, wow, I would love to write a column about that. But I don't have that outlet, so I have Twitter. So I'll take that idea and I'll do it in 280 characters, which now tells me that the columns were overwritten. <laughs> so I get the whole idea of 280 characters, and it used to be 600 words. Maybe the essence of humor is brevity. 
Oh, yeah, his brevity is the soul of wit. That's the there phrase. There you are. Right? Yeah. yeah, I think that is yeah, the phrase. Brevity Was brevity that Oscar Wilde? Wild? I don't know. I think it's, I think... it's, I think it's me. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, why don't we thank, why don't we thank Linwood thank for you. coming all this way to see us today. <laughs> this week has been a lot of fun. We'll say goodbye to our video fans and so forth. Um, and would you like to mo